You're listening to Legal Talk Network. Hi, and welcome to our podcast live from the ABA section of Antitrust Law Spring Meeting 2018. This is Jana Seidel, and I'm the host for today's episode, which is being recorded on location at the ABA section of Antitrust Law Spring Meeting 2018 in Washington, D.C. Joining me now, I have Sobrata Bhattacharji. Hi. Ian Simmons. Good afternoon. And Hill Welford. Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to the show, everyone. Before we get started, how about you tell us a little bit about yourselves? Where do you work? What do you do? Let's start with Subrata. Thanks, Yana. Well, my name is Subrata Bhattacharji, and I practice in the Canadian law firm Borden Ladner Gervais, where I'm an antitrust partner. Uh, so I guess on this panel, I am the non-U.S. attorney. Okay, Hill, what about you? So I am at Vincent and Elkins, where I do government investigations, antitrust. That's what I've done for my whole career. And uh, when I wasn't in private practice, I was at Department of Justice in various roles. Uh, Last one was Chief of Staff of the division. Great. Thanks, Ian. Yes, thank you. I'm a partner at O'Melveny & Myers here in Washington, D.C., and I've been practicing for 26 years, predominantly in the cartel area. I started at O'Melveny in the early 90s. I left uh, for four years at the Antitrust Division at Justice, worked on the Microsoft cases, and I returned in uh, 1998. Okay, well, thank you again for joining us. We're here to discuss updates on antitrust in Asia. Antitrust enforcement in Asia continues to expand as competition agencies in China, Korea, India, and Japan launch cases of global significance. In addition, newer regimes are beginning to make their mark. So what are some of the challenges of counseling companies doing business in Asian jurisdictions with active or emerging antitrust regimes? And what opportunities has this created in your practice? Well, why don't I actually start? Because uh, it's, you know, it's a very exciting time to be anyone with an interest in antitrust uh, developments in Asia. You know, one of the things that's interesting is that there are sort of established jurisdictions like Japan, which have, you know, been fairly active, uh, at least for the last 10 years or so in antitrust enforcement. But so there are established jurisdictions. There are jurisdictions like China, which have now emerged as one of the critical jurisdictions for any company really doing business globally. Uh, and with a law that is by and large based on the German competition um, law regime. And then on top of that, you have a bunch of emerging regimes, which include places like Hong Kong, which is a relatively new authority, and then new regimes in ASEAN countries like Malaysia, the Philippines. And so it's a very interesting time because at the same time as dealing with established jurisdictions with sort of well-established principles – uh, companies may also find themselves uh, dealing with sort of, I would say, more novel issues from agencies that are really just starting. Um, so as a student of antitrust, uh, it's really uh, a great time to be watching what's going on there. Great. Thank you. So you mentioned China, China being one of the critical countries and with its anti-monopoly law that was implemented about 10 years ago. They recently announced that they are going to reorganize their state ministries. Right now, I believe there are three ministries enforcing the anti-monopoly laws, and they are going to change that to one. What are your thoughts about those developments? Well, I mean, look, it's the question of how you institutionally uh, choose to enforce your antitrust laws is one that has bedeviled many jurisdictions. And so China chose uh, initially a structure that had three entities which sort of administered its laws. I'm sure that the Chinese government saw some advantages in that, but certainly from the perspective of companies dealing with agencies or with the Chinese anti-monopoly law, It was a source of some confusion and certainly some possible uncertainty. And so, you know, from a practical perspective, if you are a company uh, or somebody dealing with Chinese antitrust issue, you know, the idea that you will at least have a single agency, hopefully with a single voice, uh, is something people are looking forward to. But that's not the only way uh, you can choose to structure your antitrust enforcement. Obviously, the U.S. has chosen a bifurcated model, which seems to be working fine for the U.S., And other jurisdictions have different approaches. So we'll see how the Chinese one works. Great. And what advice would you have for young lawyers or law students that are interested in following these developments and learning more? Well, you know, the greatest thing that the ABA section has done is to take a very active interest in Asia. And we do that in ways that don't necessarily involve people hopping on planes or asking people to go great distances. A lot of that stuff is available from your desktop or from your device, from our online resources that sort of have a lot of uh, material from our CLE programming to our own sort of publications, which do focus on Asian developments. And so anyone with an interest can start literally by just going to our website, 
poking around there, looking at some of our committees that are active in international matters, uh, joining those committees if people feel that they'd like to do that. And it's a great way to start uh, and learn about something that's going to be increasingly important over the next five to 10 years. Great. Thank you. So one of the hot topics that has garnered a lot of attention again recently is the extraterritorial effects of antitrust remedies, such as the Korea Fair Trade Commission decision with regard to Qualcomm. Could you talk a little bit about the developments there and how that impacts and shapes antitrust enforcement? I would be happy to, to break the ice on that one. This is public. I represented Samsung Electronics Corporation as a third party in connection with the KFTC proceeding. And I think just looping back a bit to what was said a minute ago, when I think of antitrust in Asia, I don't think of Asia in a bubble or in a pocket. I think of it in terms of its relationship with the EU, the United States. And these this extraterritorial point you raised I think has procedural implications and substantive implications. Taking the KFTC proceeding against Qualcomm, it was said, it was contended by Qualcomm that there were procedural deficiencies in how that proceeding unfolded, namely access to the file and access to putative exculpatory documents. There was also, so there was a procedural dynamic. What is the right normative procedural model? There's also substantive normative questions that are raised vis-a-vis Asia, and in this instance, the United States. That proceeding dealt with some very complex issues of patent exhaustion, whether the standard essential patent holder has the power to choose where in the chain of distribution it will exhaust its patents, or whether, as the KFTC contended, once you undertake the friend obligation, the power to exhaust shifts to putative licensees. It is no longer held by the patent holder. All of these complex questions we also see in the United States proceeding, the FTC proceeding against Qualcomm, except for the access to the file point. So one point I would leave this group with and and your listeners, just looping back to the young people who may be listening to this, antitrust is a absolutely fascinating area because it is the law of competition. It is largely a common law area no matter what jurisdiction of the world you're in and it is deeply informed by economics. So it is constantly evolving. That evolutionary uh, nature of the law gives it some elasticity. A downside of elasticity is uncertainty. What are the rules? And is Asia applying a rule to an American company that's different than I think it should apply? So long-winded way of saying, I think questions of extraterritoriality really raise questions of reciprocity that we have seen in the United States, for example, grand jury subpoenas issued to Chinese companies, and we've seen the United States put in an amicus brief in the Vitamins case, challenging the standard for which the district court has to measure what operative Chinese law is. So questions of territoriality bring me back to the old quote, I mean, whose ox is being gored? The United States back in 1995 raised significant questions when the EU challenged GE versus Honeywell. Well, whose substantive standard, who has the monopoly on what the right substantive and procedural standards are? I'll end with a note that many of us attend these conferences, the young listeners may. There's a lot of talk about convergence, but in a lot of respects, when somebody uses that word, it's very question begging. It's a little bit in the eye of the beholder, whose standards, whose procedural standards, and whose substantive standards. So this Asia topic that we're here to discuss today is really a case study on ironing out procedural and substantive normative standards, and it's a work in progress. That's fascinating. Thank you. So one of the things you raised were um, patent exhaustion and standard essential patents. The competition law treatment of IP licensing and standard essential patents continues to be a live issue in a number of Asian jurisdictions. Can you give some insight into recent developments in this area? For example, the Beijing People's High Court Um, appellate decision in China's first case issuing an injunction for a standard essential patent or the Japanese Patent Office's licensing guidelines that recently came out. I would be happy to break the ice and be succinct if I can. The, The standard essential patent injunction issue is an important one that you flagged where China deemed it permissible. I think the overwhelming weight of American case law authority is that the standard essential patent cannot get an injunction against the alleged infringer 
unless a very high standard is met, that that alleged infringer will not discuss a license at all. So it's an unwilling licensee as opposed to a willing licensee, and we're simply talking about price. I think there's a subcurrent in the whole intellectual property, standard essential patent issue, and United States vis-a-vis -vis Asia, which we see in the Qualcomm case. And I, I don't want to speak too much in a cartoon fashion, but... I think one of the themes we see in undercurrents is that the United States is the country of innovation and the Asians, of course, are the implementers and that part of the world is not respecting American intellectual property. Qualcomm made these arguments quite candidly in the Korean proceeding. Of course, we had two large American technology companies, Intel and Apple, who were complainants in that proceeding. So. While that's a cartoonish strand to put out to the listeners, I would also urge the listeners to ask themselves, when you read in the literature of our group, when you hear academics talk or lawyers talk about implementers versus innovators, ask yourself this question. Is Apple, those of us that have an iPhone or a Samsung phone, are Apple and Samsung, are they merely implementers? Aren't they also innovators in how they design their products and bring the product to market? So some of these categories we use to discuss, the United States is about innovation, Asia is about implementing, and they're taking our intellectual property. When you get beneath that cartoon, the discussion gets very complex. And I would respectfully suggest that when you look at the content of the KFTC order against Qualcomm, and then when we read the FTC complaint against Qualcomm, there actually is more substantive convergence than perhaps, you know, we're letting on. So uh, I think it's a fascinating area. And the United States, Asia, I think we'll only, we have to obviously watch this administration. One final point I'll end with, and I'd be interested in the other speakers' reactions to this. If I had thought that for the eight years of the Obama administration, we typically think of Democrats being more activists, antitrust enforcement, Republicans being more circumscribed. I would have thought under the eight years of the Obama administration, we would have seen that administration challenge the state-owned enterprise imports in the United States for collusion. But we didn't see it. We're seeing this administration do it, the, uh, the Trump administration. So I think we're in a, a, a very interesting time in terms of enforcement. So I think the innovation versus implementer statement is an important way to look at it. Again, I, I don't want to make it sound like I endorse a cartoon version. There's definitely some uh, gray around the edges there. But one point I wanted to make is the innovation that we're talking about is not merely the classic example of a fabulous patent creator. There are other types of implementers, that United States implementers, that are under attack in Asia as well. For example, in some what of a twist of irony, Apple, which is often described as the implementer over here being sued by patent holders, Apple is the innovator of a business model also, and it is an innovator of a business model that is under attack in various Asian authority systems. For example, in Korea, it is being investigated for abuse of superior bargaining position with its model of how it goes out and markets its phones and its app store to Korean implementers and Korean developers. Google also is the implementer of a platform, a, in this case, a free platform, the Android platform, and it is under investigation in various different Asian jurisdictions about whether the implementers and the, uh, some of, of the developers, some of the OEMs, the original equipment manufacturers of the Android system are being treated fairly. So. Uh, it is exactly a correct observation to talk about this implementer versus innovator divide. I just don't want to make sure it's not limited to patents because it is an issue that is even beyond that. If I could split the discussion of what's going on in Asia, I would try to bring a little structure to it by saying that there are sort of broadly three areas. There's substantive areas of development and difference. There's procedural ones, and then there is sort of a foment of developing understanding of economics in Asia. 
And all three of those have changed tremendously in the last 15 years. Originally, a lot of the U.S. focus was on the extremely divergent process and the idea that there was due process violations or, as they usually said, uh, outside the United States procedural fairness violations. There is still a lot of that, a lot of concern about procedural fairness in Asia, but it is getting much, much better. There's a lot more transparency, a lot more access to file, a lot more of state of play meetings. Um, the Asian jurisdictions are listening, and that is a, an absolute affirmative good that there is more transparency and more procedural fairness. What we are seeing on substance is a little bit different. I am one of the chairs with Cynthia Lagdameo of the FTC of a, a current project of the ABA antitrust section called the Dominance Divergence Task Force. And we have been tasked at looking beyond the mere procedural divergences to look at the true substantive divergence that's happening. And one of the, again, to use the, the great phrase, the cartoons, one of the cartoons that is out there is, well, is Asia going to follow the U.S. or is it going to follow the EC model? Well, that is not the way the Asians see it at all. The Asians are going to follow the Asian model. And even beyond that, as Sabrata mentioned, to even say the Asian model is a little bit misleading because the China model, the Korea model, the Japan model, they're all extremely different. We're now seeing the possibility of an Indian model. Um, these are different systems, they're different laws, they're different economies, the whole way the economies are set up are different, and that is flowing towards a lot of difference in the substance of law. One thing I would tell any young person, which uh, you mentioned uh, as advice, is you need to go there. You need to get on the plane, you need to go there, you need to talk to the practitioners, and you need to understand what this new tort is, new to an American lawyer of abuse of superior bargaining position and how that isn't just regular old exclusionary conduct of the United States or EC type. It is a different type of tort with developing law all around it in various different Asian jurisdictions. And you should go try to figure out what it is and don't try to assume from a safe seat in an American city that you really understand how to counsel on it. I just actually wanted to pick up on Ian's question about sort of how we are looking at the enforcement, certainly of our, our cartel laws with respect to SOEs. And, you know, I, I think that's a very, very interesting and, and timely question. You know, my view of that is that, you know, when you look at an SOE, you know, your approach to it is going to be tied to sort of what your own approach as a government is to sort of mercantilist policies. And, you know, the current administration in the U.S. has been quite clear. And if you look at the policy paper that Mr. I guess, uh, Mr. Navarro and Mr. Ross prepared, you know, in the early stages of the campaign, you know, their sort of concern and their view about sort of potential state abuse of commercial conduct is clear. So maybe it's not that surprising that this administration, as compared to an Obama administration, may be looking at the conduct of SOEs differently under antitrust laws. Good point. May I just, Jana, uh, on Hill's point about exclusionary conduct and getting on the plane and the young lawyers understanding the, the other cultures completely agree. I think it's important. Remember, I made the point about this topic is about Asia, but Asia doesn't live in a vacuum. And, and there's an interaction, Asia, the EU, EU, United States, United States, Asia, all of these sovereigns, or we're, we're speaking broadly here, are interacting with one another. They all live in the same world. On the exclusionary conduct point, I think it's very important for us. I mentioned at the outset that antitrust is fascinating. It's also bedeviling because it is common law. It's elastic. You need to understand the facts, the cases, and the operating principles. But even if you take the concept of exclusionary conduct in well-established American case law, if you speak to the average U.S. antitrust lawyer and I ask you, Mr. Lawyer or Madam Lawyer, how do you distinguish competition from the merits? from an act of exclusion, they really can't, more often than not, tell you. To the young lawyers, competition on the merits, if my son has a lemonade stand on the left-hand side of the street, and my daughter has one on the right-hand side of the street, and all the cars go to my daughter's lemonade stand, my son has lost sales to my daughter's lemonade. That is competition on the merits. An act of exclusion also, that they have similar indicia. And United States, I won't bore the listeners with how I define 
an act of exclusion. But it's an extremely complicated uh, question. How do we define it? Uh, Janusz Wardover and Bobby Willig say it's conduct that only makes sense given its tendency to exclude. Otherwise, you wouldn't undertake it. The D.C. Circuit Microsoft opinion in 2000 has a definition which is slightly different from the United States Supreme Court decision in Aspen Highlands. So we here, and it's very important to understand, it's not like the meets and bounds of these legal principles here in the United States are crystallized and completely well established. And now we're comparing those to somebody else who's new and evolving. I think there's, we need to be careful of that assumption. And we also have to have some humility, namely, we're still trying to figure it out ourselves. We are very well advanced. You know, England's been doing it since I think 16, 15 something or other with the statute against monopolies. But because it's common law, we are making it up as we go. And so are these other new nations. So I think that's very important for all of us to understand. That's a great segue to my third point, which was about economics. 15 years ago, if you went to the JFTC or the KFTC, you would have been able to walk the halls of the agency without finding an economist in residence. Today, they have economists. They have really good ones. They have great academic economists that are paying a lot of attention to competition law over there. And uh, that has been a real sea change. It hasn't affected the Asian enforcement regimes nearly as much as the United States ones, where you find that uh, economists have an equal seat at the table. But it is absolutely true now that the antitrust enforcers will be listening to the economists in their agencies. They will be taking very seriously the economic reports that are submitted by the investigation targets, but also by the complainants. And you're starting to be able to have much more of a dialogue in Asia with sophisticated economics than you ever have before. In the long run, I believe that that is going to lead to significant amounts of convergence. I don't think we will ever be quite to the same standards, especially in dominance conduct, in part because of the different ways that the economies are structured. If you have an economy that is extremely structured around state-owned enterprises or around heavily regulated industries, and you tell an authority that you're going to apply U.S. rules, which generally say that, well, if the state has done it, or if the regulator has already ruled on it, then antitrust is out of the field. That would be telling a lot of Asian authorities that they're basically out of the field of antitrust. So that is absolutely not going to happen. But as we have more and better economic dialogue, I think there is real possibility for the United States and the Asian enforcers to speak more of the same language. And I think that is going to be a very positive development that it's really only gotten a lot of traction in the last five years. I think in the next 10 years, you're going to see an extraordinary amount of traction. So for advice for the young lawyer has always been in the United States, learn who the U.S. economists are, talk to them, understand them. Now it's also going to be true, learn who those Asian economists are and understand them. They don't talk quite the same language, but they are getting there. Those are really excellent points, and, and not to take too much air time, but on the, the economics point, absolutely right. It's an important area. I would caveat it, though, with Janusz Ordover, who's a brilliant American economist, Polish-American. He uh, sometimes likes to poke fun at the French, and he uh, said, well, you know, there's the famous quote that it, this works in practice, but it doesn't work in theory. I think it's important as well, not just to learn economic principles, but to learn how industries work. How is the airline industry similar to the hotel industry, inventory management, the pharmaceutical industry? Learning one of the pitches I would make to the listeners for antitrust is not only is it rich in terms of concepts like economics, which he'll mention, but you also get into an industry and certain economic principles may apply in one industry, but not in another. And that's why, so while it's deductive in the sense of you're reasoning downwards from economic principles, it has to be coupled with an inductive philosophy, which is learning the facts of the industry and reasoning from those facts upwards. So it's a fascinating uh, field in that respect. 
That's funny that Ian mentions the theory joke because I've had several investigations for completely different companies where an economist will look at conduct that is profitable, is clearly benefiting uh, consumers, and the Asian economist and the enforcers who have hired them will say, I still don't think this is working because I can't explain it as a matter of game theory. There is a lot of interest in game theory in Asia, much more so than I think you see in the United States. I mean, there's a lot of interest in it in the United States too, but an outside amount of interest in game theory, you should have your game theory answer ready if you go into Asia in a way that I don't think is quite as important in the U.S. or the E.C., and it is very amusing to have exactly Ian's conversation of, well, this may work in practice, but if you can't model it according to game theory or a prisoner's dilemma, we're really going to have some questions for you. It sounds like a joke, but it really does happen. I think I would add the following as a comment. You know, we've had sort of very incisive analysis and comment from two very sophisticated U.S. practitioners of antitrust. And what is very interesting, if you listen to how they've analyzed the issues and how they've thought about them, they look at these issues as almost an extension of what they are doing as their U.S. practice. Twenty years ago, the average U.S. or Canadian antitrust lawyer would not have been speaking like either Hill or Ian are speaking now. And what that means is that if there are listeners out there trying to figure out how the world of antitrust has changed and how it may further change as they continue in their careers, that is instructive because none of us um, can actually function in high-level antitrust practices in at least major jurisdictions without a reasonably grounded understanding of how major jurisdictions apply their antitrust laws. Uh, you just can't do it. And so I think the discussion that you've seen Ian and uh, Hill have underlines the point I made at the beginning of my remarks, which is you can't ignore it. Uh, and certainly if you're starting your career or in the early stages, uh, it's something you should be paying some attention to. Great. Thank you. That's actually a great segue to the last question, which um, Hill, you mentioned dialogue and the Asian jurisdictions listening. And Ian, you mentioned convergence. So I'd just like to see if you could give our listeners a little bit of a flavor about how these dialogues occur, how the ABA and the ICN kind of foster this conversation and the development of antitrust. The ABA and the ICN do complementary but very different things. The ICN, the International Competition Network, that is the enforcers getting together to talk directly to each other with a very small number of non-enforcer invited attendees. That is the enforcement community trying to get together on its own motion to talk about how best they can collaborate, the degree to which they're divergent, should they converge, things of that nature, and also, um, to a large degree, exchanging best practices. The ICN has been an absolute unalloyed good, has made tremendous strides both in promoting substantive and procedural convergence, and there's still work to do. The ABA is, for better or for worse, largely composed of defense counsel. The ABA antitrust section is. Uh, we have been trying to put many more academics, government enforcers, and plaintiffs in, but it is still largely informed by the experiences of the defense bar. And we come at it with the practical, you could say the victims of the enforcers standpoint, understanding exactly what has been going on inside these companies with the experience of having counseled on products often from the very beginning of their being put together and understanding immediately uh, without having to send out a civil investigative demand exactly why the business conduct has been done. So we end up doing a lot of comments, which often get great airings and great listens by the antitrust agencies. So we end up doing, a, I think, a very nice job complementing each other's work. Uh, the ICN working on the inside, the ABA working on the outside in a dialogue and being able to bring both the enforcement sort of view and the defense view to the table together in a, in a very collaborative way. And, you know, in some cases, the, the globalization of private practice has been driven by the activities of enforcers that are cooperating globally. And so when the ICN was created in the 90s, and I say this as someone who was lucky enough to be one of these people who gets invited to some of these meetings, it is fascinating 
because they sort of cooperate with things that they look at. And then, of course, the defense bar also has to figure out how to respond on a globalized basis. I'd add just two cents on the ABA. I've been coming to the ABA. I've been a member for 25 years. And to the younger listeners out there or those who think they may be interested in antitrust, I think the ABA has completely diversified in terms of defense and plaintiff. And I think come attend their sessions, you learn by listening. And it is a melting pot, an intellectual melting pot. I think our bar, the antitrust bar, plaintiff, uh, defendant, whatever, United States, international, you will rarely see a group of practitioners who publish so much and speak so much. And it is incredibly an enriching experience. So I'd encourage you to get involved. The absolute best way is to learn by doing. And one of the problems of being a private lawyer is you learn by doing the cases that come to you. The ABA antitrust section is a way to learn the things that haven't come to you, that you are coming towards, that you want to learn. And there is a place to put you to work if you want to call us. So please do. Well, it looks like we've reached the end of our program. I want to thank Sabrata, Ian, and Hill for the fascinating conversation and for joining us today. If our listeners have questions or wish to follow up with you, how can they reach you? Well, the easiest thing probably is just to give me a call at 416-367-6371, or you can go to our firm's website, which is www.blg.com, and you can get my details from there. You can just Google Hill Welford Antitrust, and my address at VE Law will pop right up. It's definitely email's the way, best way to reach out these days because I never know where I'm going to be. And my email address is isimmons, I-S-I-M-M-O-N-S, at omm.com. Look forward to hearing from you. Great. Thank you. This concludes another podcast from the ABA section of Antitrust Law Spring Meeting 2018. If you like what you heard, please find us and rate us on Apple Podcasts. I'm Jana Seidel. Until next time, thank you for listening. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer. Thank you.